Okay, so I uh, briefly recall what I said last time. Uh, so we want to study the tangent space to the space of all spectral curves, uh, whatever that means. Uh, but so to do that, we uh, notice that deforming a spectral curve is deforming basically the one form omega zero one and the one one form omega zero two. So uh, the deformations are somehow meromorphic forms. Uh, I will be more precise later. On the, the idea I want to use is that meromorphic forms are, uh, I mean, forms are related to cycles by form cycle dualities. Sorry, x is a projection from uh, the ah, curve yeah. sigma to sigma zero. Okay, it's not a point. No, it's it's a pro it's a map that projects sigma to sigma zero. Uh, the reason it was called x, I mean, it's the habit we had from the beginning, but uh, especially in random matrices, um, probably a better name would be pi for pro projection, or I don't know. Uh, sorry. Sigma zero is not necessarily P1. It could be, uh, I, sigma zero is a Riemann surface. Sigma is just a surface, a smooth surface. And uh, sigma uh, inherits uh, co complex structure by the pullback by X. So uh, when you change, when you move in the space of spectral curves at fixed base curve at fixed sigma zero, the complex structure of sigma may change because you are moving x. So you, you may change the, the complex structure. The complex structure is not fixed. Uh, so, uh, so, we're studying the, so I was mentioning that there is a map. So, OK. And so we have cycles, usual cycles, like these ones, usual non-contractible cycles. And we have what I call generalized cycles. And generalized, generalized cycles, are uh, elements of a dual of forms, so they act on forms like integration. Or so okay, so the action of, a, of uh, an element of a dual on a form, uh, we shall call it integral. And uh, when you integrate the one one form omega zero two, so you, you integrate one of the variables. So what remains is the one form in the other variable, and you require that generalized cycles are the ones such that. Uh, when you integrate, what you get is a meromorphic form. So an example of, uh, cycle of generalized cycles that generate this M1, uh, so we have the usual cycles that I will call first kind cycles. And indeed, uh, the integral of omega zero two of on first kind cycles uh, gives holomorphic forms that are first kind uh, meromorphic differentials. Uh, when you integrate this type of cycle, so let's say a BPK, so it's a very small circle around point P, uh, multi so weighted by, uh, by an integrand. So w w this means that if you want to compute uh, integral of BPK omega zero two of Z1, Z2, so you integrate Z2 on BPK by definition. So this is the definition. This is uh, minus 1 over 2 pi k integral over this circle CP uh, of zeta p of Z2 to the minus k omega 0 2 of Z1, Z2. Uh, well, so this 1 over 2 pi i integral over Cp, in fact, is a residue. Uh, so, but the result of integration, so when you integrate Z2 on that circle, uh, what remains is a one form in the variable Z1, and it's a one form that has typically a pole of order k plus 1 at p, at the point p. Uh, so it's a, it's a meromorphic form. And you can get all meromorphic forms in that way. So every meromorphic forms, you can find a cycle, a general cycle that produces it. Okay, so you have this map. Uh, so we, we have this map, B hat, that goes from the space of general, sorry, generalized cycles 
to the space of meromorphic forms. So to a cycle gamma, uh, you get uh, you you get a one form, which is the integral of omega zero two on gamma. Uh, I, in fact, there is another one, which is there is another map that I will call C hat, which is kind of important, that does somehow the contrary. It goes from uh, forms to cycles. So if you have a one form omega, uh, well, I I'm going to write a formula that is not really correct, but uh, it gives the idea and it can be made correct, but I will not do it. Uh, but the formula is the following. So choose, uh, so let's call AI, uh, well, okay, big I, uh, a basis of the space of cycles. Okay, the index i means, uh, well, basically you, you should take enough indices to have a full basis and it's uh, an infinite dimensional space. Uh, and define the matrix, the intersection matrix, a i inter... Sorry? Infinite. It's infinite dimensional. Very big infinite dimensional, in fact. Basically, you, you can have one cycle for each, I mean, for each point P of a surface, you have a full family of cycles. Right. Sorry? The, the terminal yeah, it's not Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, basically, uh, you, in you just label the cycles of third kind, which is... Uh, Sorry? Yes, there are cycles of third kind. Yes, third kind cycles are just chains from one point to the other. Uh, yes, they are just one chains. Because if you integrate omega zero two from, uh, so if you integrate omega zero two of z one z two from one point, let's say q prime to p prime, so in fact you follow a certain chain uh, like that, you follow a certain chain, then the result is indeed a one form in the variable z one. Chain is up to homotopy or actual chain. An actual chain? Yeah, so it's if you move it, it will be different, say. Sorry? If you move it, it will be different, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, no, maybe I did not get your question. The homology class, I mean. Yes, homology class. So it's much more. Yeah. Uh, homology class. Yes. Homology class. So basically, uh, since you integrate a meromorphic one form, it depends only on the homotopy class, and you can take linear combinations. Uh, so, but this so if you integrate that, you will get a one form in the variable z1. Well, since omega zero two has a double pole, the integral will have a simple pole at p prime and a simple pole at q prime. So it will be one one form with two po two simple poles, one at p prime, one at q prime, and it will have. So le let's call it omega uh, gamma q prime p prime of z1, okay? This one form has two poles and at q, at p prime, this omega gamma q prime p prime has ready u plus one and at q prime it has raised u minus one. So it's a one form that has raised u plus one at one of the two points and raised u minus one at the other point. It's the usual basis of third kind differentials. Uh, and it's the dual of uh, just a chain. Right. I, I'm confused. You say that it has simple poles and q prime and p prime. Yeah. Uh, how you can no. consider it? In the variable z1, it has a simple pole at p prime. So regard it as a form, as a function of z1. Yeah, but then when you move, your, your uh, integration quantum it will be different. No, 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 no. This property will always hold. What will change? Uh, what will change is the normalization on non. Yes. What is going to change is the normalization on non-contractible cycles. But on. Co uh, but this property of residue plus one or minus one will not change. Okay. But there is not a unique form that is satisfies that. And in fact, there are as many forms that is, that satisfy that as the homology class for going from Q prime to P prime. Okay, so uh, yes, so 
let me define my c hat of omega, which is, so it's going to be a cycle, and it's just going to be sum over ij uh, of ai, uh, the inverse matrix of intersection, uh, and integral over aj, sorry, let me put integral over aj of omega. Yeah, but the, inter the, 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 the inverse matrix may be zero. Maybe no, 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 no. No, in fact, you can prove that the intersection matrix is always uh, invertible. Oh, uh, but the self-intersection is zero. Sorry? The symplectic form you define previously. No, 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 of course. No, yeah. what I'm taking the inverse of a matrix, and then I take the element ij. I'm not taking the inverse of the ij element. Okay. And it's, this is the inverse matrix, and which is invertible. Okay, well, of course, this does not really make sense because the sums are infinite. Okay, this does not really make sense because the sums are infinite. But what you can check is that the right hand side is independent of your choice of basis. It's, uh, so when you change the basis. Uh, so, in a sense, the space of sets will be finite linear combination of such guys, not this way, yeah. Sorry? Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, general set will be finite linear combinations of. Yes. Yeah, I see, yeah. Yes, and the idea is that, yes, because basically a biomorphic form has a finite number of poles, so you can always arrange uh, that it's a finite linear combination. What? It's independent of basis. Yes. So here, to write this formula, I choose a basis of M1. So for instance, the basis which is written here. So I choose a basis. In that basis, I compute the intersection matrix. And I compute the period integrals the intersection matrix, and I take, so basically this is a sum of cycles weighted by a number. This is a number. But this is an infinite dimension space. Yes, exactly, that's what I'm saying. This formula does not make sense because you have an infinite sum. No, it, but it, it, it may have uncountable many dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but uh, le let, me just finish, let, let me just finish my sentence. What I'm going to say is that since it is basis independent, for a given omega, there is a way to choose a basis such that the sum is in fact fi finite. For each given omega, you can choose, basically you choose a basis which is well adapted to omega such that the sum is finite. Well, it's I, I don't want to tell all the details, but this map can be well defined. And in fact, this is more or less the Riemann bilinear identity. And uh, so it's two, two G, two G. Uh, no, sorry, no, because uh, omega can have poles. So, which means you need those uh, BPKs at some point. Uh, so, if omega has no poles, indeed, this is just the usual uh, uh, formula of our 2G cycles. In fact, G cycles, not 2G. So you say it's a linear formula. Yes. So, it classifies the cycle because Sorry. with respect to this Riemann bilinear intersection form, you can actually classify this. Yes, yes. somehow. Well, so the idea is that. So so now let me say a little bit more. So what you have is that those maps are in some sense inverse of one another. So if you take uh, B hat of C hat, well, basically B hat uh, composed with C hat is identity, which is if you take a one form, you take the cycle corresponding to that one form, and then you integrate omega 0, 2 on that one form, what you get is the one form you started with. And this is, in fact, the Riemann by linear identity, sorry. Uh, uh, this map B hat composed of C hat is defined? Yes, yes, yes because yeah, the yes. position of A. The two maps are defined, so you can compose them. Yeah, there is a theorem that if you one okay. but No. But C hat, C hat composed with B hat. C hat is well defined. No, the claim, if C hat is well defined. No, no, it's already, it's claim is well defined. No, yeah. he says that it's in, since it's an infinite dimension space. Because it and still makes sense. No no, it, it's, no, no, it's well defined. It's just I don't want to write the long definition, which is in my paper. I'm writing the short definition, which is not very well defined. But OK, just believe me, it can be, it can be made. But then this if you uh, allow only a given finite set of poles, okay, yes. it's all this kind of the same story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So th that's the idea. If you, if you know where the poles of omega are, basically you are going to pick only the BPKs that correspond to the poles, and with K no, not, not larger than the degree of the pole, 
so you need basically only the BP case with P at exactly the poles of omega and K uh, uh, no more than the degree. So you need in fact only a finite number of them. Uh, and in the sum, basically all the others here will give zero here. Either you will get zero here. Uh, and also you can arrange your basis so that the intersection matrix uh, will somehow decouple all the ones you don't want. And, uh, so it's always possible to make this sum finite. So the map is well defined and it has this property. So if you compose, compose it with B hat, you get identity. And on the, on the other side, so if you start from a certain cycle, you change it to a form by B hat. Then you change it again to a cycle by C hat. You will not get the same cycle. What you will get is, uh, so basically this map is a projection. So the idea is that uh, the space of cycles is twice larger than the space of forms. So uh, it has uh, the double dimension. And in fact, the space of, uh, yes. So this will be a projection on the image of C hat. So it has this property, of course, that pi square equals pi, while you just combine with the other. Ah, so it means that specific cycles canonical splits the direct sum. Yes, yeah, so, so exactly. And this is a Lagrangian decomposition with respect to the intersection. So which means that the space of cycle is Kerbiat plus the, the image of that projection, so which is the image of C hat. Uh, so it's a, it's a direct sum, and both are Lagrangian. So this is a Lagrangian decomposition of the space of forms of of cycles. So the idea, well, this is well known for the space H one. Uh, for the space H1, for instance, on a torus, you have just one A cycle and one B cycle. Well, very often you prefer to write it this way. So this is the A cycle, this is the B cycle. Let's say like that. Okay. The full space of, uh, so basically the H1 of your torus is uh, basically A, Z, plus uh, BZ, so it's, sorry, this is the, the integer homology space is basically Z square. And uh, if you take, you can also consider linear combinations, so it will be a complex number times A plus a complex number times B, that's all your cycles. Uh, this is an even dimension space, so the, the, the dimension of H1 is two, whereas the dimension of the space of holomorphic forms is one. So it's half of it. No, it's not splitted. Uh, yes. OK, so but it's splitted because you have chosen a certain omega 0, 2. So it's, it is your, yes, so it is your omega 0, 2 that splits the space. Your choice of omega 0, 2 splits the space. And indeed, when we are going to move into the space of spectral curves, we are going to change omega 0, 2. So the splitting changes. Kerbi hat and MC hat uh, change when you, so, so it's not a constant bundle. Uh, they change uh, over the space of spectral curves. So, excuse me. Yes, this is direct sum, sorry. OK. Um, OK. Uh, OK, but now let me go to the main theorems that I want to state. Uh, sorry, the main theorems that I want to state. Um, so why did, that, did I introduce all that? It's because uh, it's because the topological recursion is naturally expressed into this uh, in this formalism. So I remind you that. I introduced the space of meromorphic forms on cycles because I wanted to study the tangent space to the space of spectral curves. So, uh, 
So if we have S, which is a certain spectral curve, sigma, sigma 0, x, omega 0, 1, omega 0, 2, uh, well, the equivalent class modulo reparameterization of S, uh, then an element, if I want to consider uh, an element of the uh, uh, of my uh, of a tangent space. So if I want to consider a tangent vector to that, a tangent vector will be basically the data of delta omega zero one, which is a one form, and delta omega zero two, which is a one one form. So which means that my tangent space. Yes, yeah. yeah, keeping sigma zero fixed. So, yes, so we are working at fixed sigma zero, so it's not uh, the all the possible deformations, but we are keeping, uh, keeping sigma zero fixed, but we are not keeping x fixed. But we don't need to consider delta x because we can reabsorb it by reparameterization invariance locally. So the idea is that all the data of a tangent vector is contained in the deformation of omega zero one and of omega zero two. So which means that my tangent space, let me try to write it in a way that's nice. So the tangent space, so what it means is that my tangent space uh, will be somehow uh, the space of meromorphic forms plus the space of tangent of uh, tensor product of meromorphic forms. Uh, let me write it this way: symmetric tensor product. Okay. And now I will use the form cycle duality. So the idea is that we have our m1 of sigma plus m1, so now these are cycles. <coughs> the map, well, basically the map b hat on each of the components uh, puts you in the space f1 of sigma, so this is basically b hat, plus m1 of sigma, m1 of sigma, sim, so I mean I. No, uh, there is some uh, problem with degrees. It should, it, it, it's a graded degree that, that. Not graded? Not graded? Because no, it, working with projective space may be some. No. no, 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 it's not graded. No. It's not graded. Yeah. Well, yeah, remember there is. So this is a, a so this is more or less the same thing as the tangent space. No, no the kernel spectral curves. Kernel is wrong because yes, kernel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's yeah. So it's yes, it's the curve of the tensor. Yes. Okay. Yes, you're right. Uh, but well, okay. What I want to say is not well. This is not important. Okay, I, I have it corrected on my notes. But uh, what is important is that basically uh, this, uh, yes, uh, yes, so this is isomorphic to that. Uh, yes, this is isomorphic to that. And the idea is that uh, we have a map. Uh, so what I wanted to say is that this is isomorphic to m1 of sigma quotiented by Kirby hat plus I think well again it's a quotient by Kerr uh, hat okay let me write it this way so uh, 
So the idea is that uh, this space somehow is isomorphic to only equivalence classes in that space. So it's half the dimension. Um, well, it's half of infinity. No, not half, because we take symmetric square of something. OK. In fact, I will concentrate myself only on the first part, mostly. And then OK, OK. OK. Well, anyway, it's one, one third of infinity is infinity. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's infinity on both sides. The dimension is infinite on both sides. I, I think it doesn't matter for what I want to say. So, but the idea is that I want to use this map to produce, to, to represent tangent vectors in terms of cycles. So the idea is that we want to have a map that goes from the space of cycles into the tangent space. That's what I need to have a map that goes from the space of cycles to the tangent space. So I will define, so I will define, uh, I will define a map that to a cycle, so uh, I want to define a map from M1 of sigma plus M1 of sigma tensor M1 of sigma sim into the tangent space. Yeah, yeah, I, but I'm going to write it explicitly now. Okay, if I take gamma, so if I take gamma there, what is d gamma? Okay, and in order to define d gamma, I just need to say how it acts on uh, omega zero one and, ome and on omega zero two, and I will define it in this way: omega zero one of z one will be, by definition, uh, so it will be b hat so of gamma. So basically, d hat will be b hat of gamma, and by definition, this means that d gamma omega zero one of z one will be the integral of z two belongs to gamma of omega zero two of z one z two. That's the definition. Now I need to say how this acts on omega zero two. And the definition of how it acts on omega zero two, so omega zero two has two variables, z one, z two, and the definition, by definition of d gamma, this will be the integral of z three belongs to gamma of omega zero three of z1, z2, z3. That's by definition. So basically, you, I define the tangent vector on how it acts on omega zero 1 and omega zero 2. That's the definition. And now I need to, and if I now I take an element of that tensor product, so if I take gamma 1 cross gamma 2 plus gamma 2 tensor gamma 1, let's say one half of that, then uh, then how do I define d gamma 1? So, okay, let me adopt this notation, but we, in fact, it should be made uh, symmetric. Of omega zero 1, by definition, it will be 0. And d gamma 1 tensor gamma 2 of omega zero 2 of z1, z2, by definition, will be 1 half of integral of so let's say z3 belongs to gamma 1, uh, z4 belongs to gamma 2, of omega 0, 2, of z1, z3, omega 0, 2, of z2, z4, plus, and you symmetrize, z1, z4, Omega zero two of z three z two z three. Which is second plus from the symmetric square of b hat, yeah? Excuse me? Yes, this is b hat. Yeah. Ah, so just we modify on a map. Uh, yes. So this is just the action of b hat, uh, except for this one where you have this omega zero three that appears. Okay, now I can state one of my theorems. Now that we have just made some definitions. Uh, 
So the main theorem is that the deformations of omega gn. So we have for every gn different from 0, 0, we have, and indeed omega 0, 0 was never defined so far. And I say we could not, I, I, I did not define it on purpose. And I'm going to speak about that now. Uh, but d gamma of omega g n is basically integral over gamma of omega g n plus 1. So this is the theorem, which means that d gamma of omega g n of variable z1 zn is integral of when you integrate the n plus 1 variable on gamma of omega g n plus 1 of z1 zn, zn plus 1. This theorem is in fact very similar to what appears in string theory under the name uh, special geometry or... Okay. Uh, and, okay, and d gamma 1 tensor gamma 2 of omega gn uh, is uh, integral of gamma 1 integral over gamma 2 uh, of omega g minus 1 n plus 2 plus sum over g1 plus g2 equals g. And uh, OK, so you should have written it with. So here we have. So it's very similar to the formula that appears in the topological recursion, z1, zn, zn plus 1, zn plus 2. OK, let me give them the name z and z prime. So we integrate z on gamma 1 and z prime on gamma 2, plus sum over g1 plus g2 equals g, sum over i1 uh, I2 equals all the variables, Z1, Zn. Uh, omega G1 cardinal of I1 plus 1, uh, Z1, sorry, I1 and Z. Omega G2 cardinal of I2 plus 1 of I2, Z prime. OK. And in fact, this second relation. If you need some normalization, multiplicative factor, there is a one half upstairs. No, because uh, all the forms that appear here are symmetric forms, so it doesn't matter. You could symmetrize, but somehow it is already symmetric. Yeah. It is already symmetric. Uh, and so I think here it's. Uh, well, again, it's no disk. Uh, OK, I, I have to check that in my notes. Uh, but in fact, this second relation is very similar to what is called BCOV relations in uh, string theory. So we have both. So Basically, what it says is that if you want to compute deformations, uh, you don't really have to go in another point in the moduli space. You don't have to explore a, a neighborhood in your moduli space of spectral curves. You just have to stay, stay at the same spectral curve and compute integrals on cycles. It's so just it's just the tangent space. So, but the idea is that since the tangent space is in some sense, isomorphic to the space of cycles, or let's say to half the space of cycles, uh, you, can, uh, you can just stay at the same spectral curve and integrate cycles, integrate uh, your forms over cycles instead of really uh, taking derivatives. So, uh, and, and if you allow to change sigma zero? No, here I keep sigma zero fixed. But this would be interesting to see what happens when you change sigma zero. Okay. Well, 
I will tell you, so in fact, I did not, I did not want to spend time on that, but I want to have uh, an integer structure on my space of cycles. I did not describe it, but the integer structure is mostly based on the fact that I choose, I say that this one, for instance, is an integer cycle. Uh, and I can do that only if this map zeta is kept fixed and zeta is a chart, is the coordinate in a chart of sigma zero. So I want to keep sigma zero fixed to be able to do that. So if I want to define my integer structure, I need to keep sigma zero fixed. Otherwise, the integer structure will change. So this is a kind of Hodge theory. Uh, and for the moment, I want to keep the integer cycles fixed. Uh, and yes, later, that would be a good idea to study what happens when you change the integer cycles. Uh, so what I want to define now, so the idea now is can we define an omega zero zero that would also satisfy the theorem? Let me just make one more question. If you will allow later sigma zero change with this symplectic transformation of the world. In fact, this is something that I have not studied yet. <laughs> so it will not be in the lecture and it will not, it's not... It's actually just surface, just change everything. No, yeah. just sigma zero. Okay. Yeah. I think this is a very interesting question, but this has not been much studied. And this is a very... Uh, yeah. It's a very interesting question, but I don't know if the answer is really known at the moment. Uh, so I was in my s chapter four, and now I'm in my section four on define of F0, which is uh, so F0 of my spectral curve, which is omega zero zero. So remember, I call Fg the omega g zero form, so the, the form with uh, which is a zero form, which is just a complex number. So F0 is, is just a complex number. So I want to define it. So basically, can we define an omega zero zero such that this, this would continue to hold? Is it possible? And the answer is no. The answer is no for a very simple reason. Compute, uh, imagine that uh, d gamma of omega zero zero would be integral over gamma of omega zero one. So then, uh, so assume, so imagine, but it's going to be wrong, that we, you can define d gamma one of omega zero zero equals uh, integral over gamma of omega zero one. Then take another derivative. Then take d gamma 1, d gamma 2 of omega 0, 0, and compare it to d gamma 2, d gamma 1 of omega 0, 0. Well, by definition, this would be the integral over gamma 2 of omega 0, 1. You act again with d gamma 1, so it will be an integral. So it would be an integral of gamma 1, integral of gamma 2 of omega 0, 2, minus integral of gamma 2 integral over gamma 1 of omega 0, 2. For almost all the double G ends, uh, there is no pole at coinciding points, so the two integrals do commute, except for omega 0, 2, which has a pole at coinciding point. Omega 0, 2 has a pole on the diagonal, so those two integrals, so the order of integration does matter, and this is what I define as the intersection. which means that uh, omega zero zero satisfying this cannot exist for general, uh, well, cannot exist in general. Uh, I mean, there is no omega zero zero that would satisfy this for every gamma. But you see that it can exist if you restrict gamma to a Lagrangian manifold. So if you restrict uh, the possible gammas to a Lagrangian sum manifold, then it can be well defined. So it's kind of integrable theorems. It's, yeah. a, it's like an integrable theorem. Yes, yes, yes. So, so which means that the only way to define omega zero zero is to make a choice of a Lagrangian sum manifold. It's just a subspace. Excuse me. It's a subspace. It's a subspace of a space of cycles. But remember that the tangent space was also somehow a subspace of a space of cycles. So remember the space of cycles was too large 
And in fact, the tangent space is only a kind of quotient, quotient of that. So, uh, or you can take a representant of the equivalence class, which is equivalent to say that you cho should choose the Lagrangian in your space of cycles. So in fact, the space of cycles was too large. For all the omega g or g ends, it does not matter because, uh, yes, maybe I should say that there is a lemma, which is that if gamma belongs to Kirby hat, then uh, uh, integral of gamma of omega g n equals zero. Sorry. So uh, basically, for every g n except uh, so if g n different from zero one. So except for omega zero one, uh, this definition descends to the quotient by Kirby hat. So uh, basically, there is no problem. But for f0, 0, it does not descend to the quotient. You have to choose a representant. You cannot push forward to the quotient. You have to choose a representant. So to choose, so, excuse me? This is the consequence of the theorem, the lemma. What we call lemma is it? Yes, but in fact, to prove, uh, to prove a theorem, in fact, you need the lemma. <laughs> okay. uh, so it's a slight thing, when say. Gamma 1 is equal to gamma 2, then gamma square is 0. Okay, so yeah. then it's automatically, of course. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, if gamma 1 equals gamma 2, the left hand side is 0. <laughs> there is no contradiction. Then it's defined. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is yes, this is the curvature. So this says that the intersection form is the curvature. Uh, so how do you define F zero then? Uh, how do you define F zero? Um, so definition of F zero. Uh, so, choose a Lagrangian L uh, in your M1 of sigma. Okay? Uh, maybe curved, yeah. It's a straight uh, subspace. Subspace, sub submanifold. Uh, yes, subspace. Yes, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Yes, linear, I mean, uh, yes, linear uh, subspace. Then you shall define F0, uh, so it will depend on your curve, on your spectral curve, and it will depend on the Lagrangian. It depends on both. It is one over uh, okay, one over four or one over four pi i, uh, one over of of c hat of omega zero one. Remember, so I have omega zero one, which is a form. I transform it into a cycle uh, intersection with the projection on L parallel to curve B hat uh, of the same thing of C hat of omega zero one. So this is a projection on L and parallel to curve uh, B hat. L could be, L could be curve B hat itself. Indeed, then you would get zero. So what kind of intersection it is? Mm, sorry? Yeah, this intersection yeah. of cycles. Yeah, this is the, the intersection of cycles. No, it's on the subspace, but this is on the no, element. No, it's, it's element, but it's a cycle. No, no, that should be transversal or something like that. I yeah, know. well, I mean, I mean, the intersection is defined al also on the restriction to L. Uh, L should be such a projection of transversal. Right, you, you cannot project. No, no, it's it's not transverse should be, otherwise it may be empty. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It yeah, be transverse to yeah, you need L to be transverse to curve. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, you need L to be transverse to curve hat. hat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need L to be transverse to curve hat. Slash there, right? 
Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I need to. Well, ju just let me tell you what it gives in the basis. In the basis, uh, so, v so may maybe I, uh, I'm not sure I wrote this correctly, but. It seems you could choose L to be image of CFR. It is not a standard choice. Uh, yes, and then you would get zero. Oh, zero again. Yeah, because oh, yeah, because you get a yeah. okay, see. Yes, then you would get zero. Uh, but in fact, it's not a good choice. First, because the image of C hat, in fact, is never an integer uh, Lagrangian uh, because it's, it's the Riemann bilinear identity. Basically, the imaginary part is always strictly positive, definite. So the imaginary part of, of image of C hat as always an imaginary, so there is always a positive imaginary component, so it can never be integer, for instance. No, what do you mean by integer? It means it's, it's integer, in integer structure, yes. 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 Local coordinates. Yeah. So it coefficients with integers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But so image of C hat is not really a very good yeah. Lagrangian, yeah. and I if you choose that one, F0, you get zero. Okay. Uh, so, uh, OK, I will not go well. The idea is that in some good coordinates, so for instance, for the torus, uh, well, OK. Uh, OK, uh, I'm not going to say more about that. But the theorem is that then this F0 also defines uh, d gamma of F0 is integral over gamma of omega 0, 1 for gamma uh, belongs to L. So it's true for all gammas belonging to L, but not all gammas. OK. Uh, now, let me. Well, I, I just want to show you that this is, in fact, more or less cyborg written relations for F0. So F0 is the prepotential. So uh, remark. So if you take. Uh, so imagine that sigma is compact of genus G, and you take AI, BI with I equals 1 to G, a symplectic basis of, uh, of H1 of sigma Z, OK? You take a symplectic basis, so it's not unique. There are, there are plenty of symplectic basis that you could choose. So basically, this is. This sigma is Adam's It's any curve. It's any curve. So for instance, A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on. And imagine, uh, imagine, so assume, so assume. Kirby hat uh, is basically uh, C times, uh, well, is generated by uh, the, A, the A cycles. So basically, we require that omega 0, 2 vanishes on all A cycles, but not B cycles. This is a situation that's very, that most often you, you have. Uh, in all, almost all practi practical examples, that's what you have. Uh, then, uh, then what is F0? F0 would be 1 over 4 pi i, sum over i equals 1 to g, of integral over a i of omega 0, 1, integral over b i of omega 0, 1. Uh, well, OK, that, uh, that's correct if omega 0, 1 has no poles, for instance. But if it has poles, then there are extra terms associated to the cycles. But this is the part I want to say. So now imagine that I define AI equals 1 over 2 pi i integral of, omega of uh, AI of omega 0, 1. That's my coordinates. Then d over d a i 
is in fact the dBi of my B cycle. And, and L is the B cycle, the, you choose L to be spanned by uh, Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, sorry, uh, and I choose L to be uh, spanned by B cycles. Yes, L equals B cycles. So it's a Lagrangian. Uh, no, sorry, in that case, sorry, uh, when I said uh, it vanishes if you choose L equals Kirby hat, no, it's, it does not vanish, and this is the case where you choose Kirby hat. No, no, it's not Kirby hat, it's A cycle. Oh, yes, so, sorry, 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 yes, it's wrong. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, but the idea is that you have that, and dF0 over dAi are the B cycles. And this is the Seibar-Witten relations for the prepotential. So this is just an example of that. And it's mostly due to the fact that d over dAi is dBi. It's AD. Yeah, yes. yeah. So BI is the cycle dual to the deformation of the AI parameters. But so the idea is that for every for every coordinate you could choose, you have a dual cycle corresponding to it. But this, this, this actually turns out to be cyber curve. Yeah. yeah, so that's what I... For the moment, it's absolutely any curve. Okay, then, okay. And indeed, if you take... So the idea also is, if you take... Uh, If now you consider forms with poles, and if you consider the, as parameters instead of your AIs, you consider the, Laurent, the coefficients in the Laurent series expansion. So imagine that omega 0, 1 of Z uh, behaves near a pole P as sum of T, P, K. Uh, so the local coordinate, let me call it zeta P of Z to minus K minus 1 d zeta p of z, so it's a one form, so sum over k uh, equals basically 0 to the degree of a pole at p, okay, plus analytic at p, okay. You see that the TPKs is 1 over 2 pi i integral over a cycle of omega 0, 1 with this APK. It just the, you see, it picks the residue of uh, coefficient and it's precisely TPK. And d over d TPK, you can check, is so. Basically, this cycle is the one that computes d over d tpk. And instead of cyborg written relations, this would be uh, what's called Miwa Jimbo relations for this kind of. Uh, so, in fact, with this formalism, we, uh, you, we, we have together on the same footing the cyborg written relation and Miwa Jimbo relations. It's, it's the same thing. Or Magrange relations, they are the same thing in that, uh, in that description. So now, uh, also, we want to study finite deformations. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure because it's one hour. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, okay. There is another thing which is finite deformations. So here, so far, I define only tangent vectors. And the idea is that now you would like to integrate the flow along a tangent field, a tangent vector field. Uh, so basically, what you would like to define is not an infinitesimal deformation of your spectral curve, but your spectral curve defined with a finite deformation, and which I will also write as exponential t d gamma s. So basically, we are just going to uh, integrate the flow and somehow assuming gamma fixed. So in order to do that, uh, 
I mean, having tangent, knowing the space of tangent vectors at each point in our moduli space is not exactly enough. We, we need also to see how the tangent space uh, deforms when we move in the moduli space. But because there is this integer structure, because we have an integer structure, uh, we can, uh, I mean, very, the, the, um, in fact, the space of cycles is rigid. So another way to say that is that if you want, so if you deform your curve, you know how to follow the, the cycles, for instance, the AIs, it's just topological. So when you do a small deformation of your curve, you, the A cycle will remain the A cycle somehow. Uh, and uh, or for those cycles, you see, since you project to a chart, you, so you, so you, you go from, you, you have one curve, you project to a chart, you deform your curve, and you put it, pull it back to the, to the curve, and so you know how to follow cycles. Uh, so cycles basically are rigid, they are not deformed. Uh, cycles are rigid, they, they don't get deformed. And uh, that's called local system. Sorry? You just call it local system. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. So the theorem, so the theorem which is almost something totally obvious, is that if you want to compute omega g n of some curve, so of the deformed curve, uh, z1, zn, by definition, well, almost by definition, this is the result of this. It, uh, this means that this is, uh, I will write it as the Taylor series expansion. So it's sum from m equals 0 to infinity t to the m over m factorial and uh, integral over gamma, integral over gamma of omega g n plus m of z1 zn and then all the other variables that you integrate over the cycles. And the theorem is that the, uh, it's absolutely convergent on a disk. Uh, so T belongs to a certain disk of center zero and some radius. And the radius, uh, well, let me call it R gamma uh, with R gamma. Uh, positive. It can sometimes, well, I'm not sure, but I think it can be infinity. Well, okay. So, but the idea is that it's always absolutely convergent in a certain domain. Basically, it's uh, all the flow is well defined until you pinch a cycle. And if you start it with, with a curve that is smooth, you pinch a cycle only after a certain time. So, but there is in general a radius of convergence, which means that you cannot go too far. Well, in particular, uh, something happens when, uh, sorry, when some ramification points get, uh, I mean, when the cycle uh, meets a ramification point, something happens. But this happens only after a certain time. Okay. So the idea is that you can compute. So I'm, I'm defining all that because I want to go to the notion of integrable systems. So basically, I want, I'm going to use all that to rewrite uh, hero equations and things like that in integrable systems in terms of cycles. So the general idea behind all that is that um, uh, we want to define tau functions on the space of spectral curves. Uh, and usually tau functions are defined as function of times, but times are only coordinates in that space. And the idea is that uh, the local coordinates are somehow the coordinates in the tangent space, and I want to take the local coordinates as in fact coordinates in the space of cycles. And in the space of cycles, everything becomes extremely simple. Uh, so basically, all the complicated part comes from the change of coordinates from the space of cycles to your usual coordinates. Uh, exactly like in, well, I mean, that's the general philosophy of integrable systems. If you choose the good action angle coordinates, 
the motion is linear at constant velocity. Um, indeed, in the space of cycles, it, it will be the case. It's linear at constant velocity. So, first of all, I, I'm going to define what I call the Hirata derivative. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me call that 4, 5. Hirata derivative. There is uh, one tangent vector which plays a particularly important role, and I will give it a name. So for every z belonging to sigma, I define delta z will be a certain tangent vector, and it will be the tangent vector with, in those notation is b, z1. And uh, in fact, if you see, if you want to study how it behaves in function of z, you realize that it transforms not really like a, a function, but like a one form. You see, in this definition, there is, I'm using a chart coordinate. Uh, I'm, I'm using a chart coordinate. So basically, so I remember, I remind you that bz1 is a small cycle, it's minus 1 over 2 pi i, a small cycle around z, uh, weighted by a function, by a meromorphic function, and typically the meromorphic function x of uh, the variable minus x of z. So it's a function of some variable, which I don't name, uh, minus x of z. And uh, in fact, you want to make it a one form. So you multiply the, re the result by dx of z. So it's a one form valued uh, tangent vector. It's somehow it's a tensor product of a one form and a tensor vector, a uh, uh, tangent vector. And uh, you can check that now this is independent of a choice of chart. This does not depend anymore on the choice of chart. And uh, this is uh, so an important theorem is that delta z of omega gn of z1 zn is just omega gn plus 1 of z1 zn z. So it's just doing that. Uh, and it's called, uh, so in the language of matrix models, this was called the insertion operator. And because of that. So that's how it was named in matrix models, but it's just doing that. Uh, another thing that's interesting, it's when you go to local coordinates. Uh, so in the TPK coordinates. So choose Z very close, so in a neighborhood of P. Of your point P, so the, the same way it was written above. So the TPKs are the coefficients of the Laurent expansion. Then delta Z is the following operator. Uh, let me get it right. Um, so I think, uh, so it will be d zeta p of z, sum from k equals uh, probably 0 to infinity or 1 to infinity. Uh, zeta p of z to the minus k minus 1 uh, d over d zeta p, uh, sorry, d t p k. In the terms that is symmetry in the z variables. Excuse me? There is no trivial fact that it's symmetric in the z variables. The omega is symmetric in the z variables. Yes. And it keep, is it visible from the... No, no. Z, or is it still no. No. 
Well, somehow it means that omega gn uh, was the, sorry, this theorem says that omega gn of z1 zn was delta z1 delta zn of omega g0. And they commute. The delta z, the delta z commute. Uh, no, you have to do a computation. It's not, it's not difficult, but uh, you have to. So you can prove symmetry this yes. by showing the delta commute. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, indeed. OK. Um, no, but in fact, you, mm, well, OK. It's not very difficult, but it's not uh, trivial either. OK. So what I just wanted to say is that writing, so plus analytic No, sorry, I think this is k minus 1. Uh, let me check. Um, so, um, yes, no, sorry, k times k minus 1. OK, so you see this is a Taylor expansion when z is close to p. This is just a Taylor expansion. So this operator is globally defined everywhere on the curve, whereas this is just a Taylor expansion in the neighborhood of P. But in the whole literature of integrable systems, the, this is how the Hirota derivative is written everywhere in all books. But somehow this is only the Taylor expansion in the neighborhood of P. This is not globally well defined. This one is globally well defined. This one is only local uh, way of writing things. But so the idea is that this is the op operator which is needed for defining integrable systems. It's defined for every z on the curve. On the curve. On the curve. On the curve. No, it's defined everywhere on the curve. To define it, we used a local coordinate, but we show that it transforms well under uh, transition functions. So from one chart to another chart, it transforms well as a one form. So it's, it's a one form uh, which is well defined globally. It's meromorphic globally. It's kind of index pairs. <laughs> okay. So, so now I want to go to loop equations. Uh, I will call that loop equations. But in fact, this is very similar to Virasoro algebra equations or to uh, W algebras. Uh, So the idea is the following. We have this operator delta z that is defined on the curve above. And somehow we want to define an operator defined on the base. So somehow we want to push it to the base. So the idea is to somehow to push uh, delta z to the base. So Assume so. Assume so. Here, we assume that uh, x from sigma to sigma zero uh, is a finite degree covering. So it so which means that uh, so if you take sigma zero and you have your curve sigma, uh, every point here has a finite number of pre images. So this is the map x. So uh, let's call that one z1 of x, z2 of x, and so on, zr of x. OK. The idea is, for instance, the operator, define the operator sum over i equals 1 to r of uh, 
delta zi of x. This is an operator defined on the base. Let me call it omega, sorry, omega 1 of x. This is an operator, and it's one form valued. Okay? Basically, the idea is we are going to define all the operators which come from symmetric combination of the deltas of the pre images. And I will call them the uh, W algebra operators because they will uh, have something to do with W algebras. And for instance, W2 will be the stress energy tensor. And so. Yes, OK. OK. Uh, X is also a point on the image. So okay, I, I, I agree that the there is a confusion of, of notation. So let me put a small uh, straight X here. Okay. It's because, okay, this is a new subject which developed like that. On <laughs> okay. Okay. And in fact, the numbering, the, the, the way you label the pre-images doesn't matter because we are going to take only symmetric combinations. This can be written without choosing a labeling. Wk of x will be, by definition, sum of i1 of product of delta z i1 of x. Sorry, this is a straight x. So this is this operator. Mm -hmm. The operator means differential <coughs> operator or not? Sorry? The operator in what sense? So it acts, so it's a derivative, it's a product of derivatives. Ah, it's a differential operator. Yes, it's a differential operator acting on the space of uh, functions on the space of spectral curves. Yeah. It acts on functions of space on the space of spectral curves, and uh, so if you want, it's a tensor product of uh, of tangent vectors, and uh, uh, yes, and it's uh, so remember delta z was a one form valued, so this is a, a k form, a k order form. So for instance, omega two is a quadratic differential. I mean, with respect to the variable x, it's a quadratic differential on the base, and it acts as a differential operator on functions of a spectral curve. And indeed, if you know in conformal field theory, uh, the, the stress energy tensor transforms more like, uh, like a quadratic differential. Well, in fact, like a projective connection, but it's nearly the same thing as a quadratic differential. Uh, so, so this is the definition. Uh, in fact, so no, I will define something a little bit more. So it's also useful to take a summation over k, and let me define omega of uh, w of x y is a summation from k equals zero to r. So let me define also omega zero of x equals one. So the identity operator. Uh, zero form valued, uh, minus one to the k, y to the r minus k, wk of x, uh, and uh, yes, so somehow this is the product from i equals one to r of uh, y minus delta z i of x. And here, y, uh, if you want this to be well defined, you see that y should be a one form. So one should be in the cotangent, uh, sorry, yes, y should belong to the canonical bundle uh, of sigma zero. Well, no. y should belong to the cotangent space of sigma zero over x. For this to be, I mean, this is a one form, you want this to be a one form. 
But this is the usual language in Hitchin systems somehow. Uh, okay. So this is, but somehow this is just a generating function for all the W case. Sorry? Yes, up to R, I mean the total number. So you want something symmetric in all the pre-images. So we shall say that a function obeys the loop equations if, uh, so I will state the theorem. So if we define, uh, so, no, sorry, I, I will say more like a definition than state a theorem afterwards. Uh, so definition, a function f from the space of spectral curves to complex numbers, whatever that means, if it's well defined, is said to satisfy loop equations. This name came from matrix models, but it should probably be replaced by, I don't know, Virazo constraints or W algebra constraints. Uh, if, uh, so for every K and every X, belong to sigma zero uh, minus branch points. No, sorry. I, I should not write it this way. For every k, wk of x applied to f. So this is going, so the result of that is a kth order differential form on sigma. So for instance, w1 is a one form, w2 is a quadratic differential on sigma zero. So this, sorry. So this is a kth order form on the base, sigma zero. And uh, you require that it is so. It's a case order form on sigma zero, and you want it to have uh, with no poles at branch points. Sorry. At other places, it doesn't. Okay. I, there is a second part. And if you take the generating f this generating function f of x, y applied to f, divide. So, uh, okay. I should have chosen. Uh, okay. Uh, product from y minus uh, omega zero one of zi of x uh, sorry um, start from two uh, okay sorry 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 x of z, y applied to f. So I choose a point z on my, so I have my curve, I have my base. I choose a point z here. This is x of z. And then I have other pre-images. Okay? So I push it on the curve and pull it back and I get several other pre-images. Uh, so, so if I take one of our product of uh, product of z prime belongs to x x minus one of x of z, but different from z of y minus omega zero one of z. So if I take that and compute that at y equals omega zero one of z, okay, then you can check that. So somehow you see there will be a 
product of so this is an half order differential form. This is an R minus one order differential form. So the ratio is a is a one form. The ratio is a one form. The ratio is a one form of Z on the on the curve. But now it's a one form on sigma, not on sigma zero. And uh, I want that it has no pole. Uh, well, it has no pole at all. It belongs to H1 of sigma. No pole at all. So neither poles at ramification points, nor poles at the poles of omega zero one or nowhere. Uh, well, this is not the full true statement, but. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, upper street. So it's a one form. So this is a holomorphic one form. Okay, or omega one if you like. Okay. But in my notation so far, I wrote it H1. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> because it's the dual of H1. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry about bad notations. Uh, this was not my field at the origin, so I. Uh, on wrong notations, maybe, but so that's what I mean. This is a holomorphic one form. So it has no poles anywhere. So not every function f does satisfy that. In fact, very few functions f do satisfy that. Excuse me? Looks like what f looks like. Well, so I will give you one solution, and in fact, a family of solutions. So that's the that's one of the main theorems. So the theorem. So no, remember that I wanted to define a certain function of S of a spectral curve that I call the partition function, and not exactly for the moment the tau function. I'm not going to write it. I'm not going to call it the tau function. You will see why in a moment, but. I would like to define some of fg of s, where I remind you that fg is omega g0. It's the usual, it's the standard notation. This is not well defined because sum from g equals 0 to infinity is ill defined. But remember that we had the property that fg of lambda s was uh, lambda to the 2, 2 minus 2g fg of s. Okay? Uh, so, and also since I have F0, I should start with there should be something special for F0 of S, and so we, it means we have to choose the Lagrangian. Let me write it this way times exponential sum from G larger than 1 of Fg of S. But since this is ill defined, I will use the scaling property to define it as a formal power series, like that, h bar to the 2g minus 2. And here I need an h bar to the minus 2. So this is a definition. You see that? It's really h2. <laughs> yes, it's h bar to the minus 2. Uh, it's the baker akizer function, which will start with h bar to minus 1. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, it's h bar because WKB it's... Yeah, yeah, but this is the partition function. This is not the wave function. The wave function is closely related to that, and it will start with an h bar to minus 1. But this is, uh, this is an h bar to minus 2. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the definition, and the theorem is that so this is a formal series of h bar. I mean, the log is a formal series of h bar. So this is not defined really as a function, but as a formal function. But the CRM is that it satisfies loop equations. So the map that to S associate Z is solutions of loop equations. In fact, this is not the only solution. 
uh, this map if I shift my spectral curve by a certain cycle gamma and if gamma is the first kind cycle sorry h bar inverse uh, and I do it this way but you see I can also uh, put a parenthesis here and put h bar gamma so this is in fact a small deformation of s so it's just a small deformation of s but it's a finite deformation of the sum h bar minus 1 to the s plus gamma okay uh, but this is also a solution for every gamma uh, belongs to h1 of sigma z Sorry? Well, I choose integer, okay, I can, well, no, the point is that I want, I can choose a linear combination of integers, but provided by the coefficient of a linear combination do not depend on the spectral curve. I mean, I want to choose true constants. No, I mean, uh, uh, other integer cycles which are not in H1, but this integer structure. Which no, here I definitely need H1 because I don't want to be able to generate poles. So the H1 cycles, so the true first kind cycles, will never generate poles. So it's important. So, but this just says that somehow there is not a unique candidate to be a solution of loop equations. There is a full set of, I mean, there are lots of functions that are solutions, and you can take linear combinations of them, and they are still solutions, because the loop equation is linear in, in terms of f. So any linear combination of solution is solution. And the idea is that among this whole vector space of solutions, there will be one solution that in addition will obey hero equations. Or, or I mean, there will be some solutions that will obey hero equations. So there are plenty of solutions of loop equations, but among them, some of them will obey hero equations. So it's also related to, the, to what you see in conformal field theories. So somehow the amplitudes are linear combinations of conformal blocks where you sum over uh, something which is typically uh, what people call intermediate charges or auxiliary parameters. So basically this gamma will play the role of auxiliary charges of, or, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the true uh, CFT amplitude is going to be a sum. If you can again say this uh, argument yeah, to say some, uh, whole generic, I didn't understand this cycles, uh, yeah. poles, religion. You said something. Yes, I said something. I want gamma really to belong to H1. So gamma is made of s true cycles, mm -hmm. not this type of cycles, okay. not this type of cycles, because these ones would generate poles. Okay. So that why that why these integers are necessary? I don't know. No. It's not really integers. It's just that, yes, no, the, the, the thing that I say is, is that if I take, so, I, so let me take gamma equals sum of ci gamma i, where gamma i is the basis of h1 of sigma z, so integer cycles, and ci belongs to c and are constant. So you see... No, CI belongs to Z. Numbers. No, no, numbers. complex numbers, in fact. Complex numbers, but constant. The idea is that uh, I want the... You see, since gamma... Well, the idea is that gamma is defined in a space that depends on the spectral curve, but somehow I want to keep it fixed. Well, okay. Okay, and... What I should have said also is that you want to keep the Lagrangian constant also. Of course, it will not work if the, if the Lagrangian depends on your choice of spectral curve. So if, when you move in the space of spectral curve, if you move also your Lagrangian, you will not satisfy those equations anymore. So you want to keep the Lagrangian fixed. Um, so, so you see this Z is a good candidate for being something, some interesting object. It's a, we already know it satisfies loop equations. Uh, and we would like it to be also a kind of uh, tau function, uh, but it has some bad things. 
uh, first, it depends on this Lagrangian. Uh, and it's not, it's not modular invariant. If you change your Lagrangian, Z changes. Uh, so, just one remark, if you re... So, uh, sorry, I want to go to CFT, uh, so what time is it? Okay. I, okay. Uh, I want just to make, uh, to say something. Yes, I think it was fine set, five seven. Uh, so CFT, the link to conformal field theory. So VID, just a notation. So if you just say as a notation that your Z L of well, le let me call it S, so somehow it includes the scaling by h bar minus 1. It does not really matter for what I'm going to say. I'm just going to write it as something like that. Okay. Whatever that means, it's just a notation. And it depends, uh, well, usually people write the dependence on sigma 0. You can also include the dependence on your Lagrangian L. Uh, well, basically, it depends. It's also a function of all the parameters that you have in the problem, but this is just a notation. So if you want to put the h bar to the minus 1, on h bar to the minus 1, so this is the notation that is usually used in conformal field theory to denote conformal blocks or amplitudes. Now, let me act with some z1 delta z n of z l okay this will just be a notation okay sorry i should have so again i will take z i1 of x1 z i n of x n so if you want, I have my curve above, my base curve, and I choose several points here, x1, xn, okay? For each of them, I choose, for instance, zi1 of x1, uh, and zin of xn. I choose a pre-image, and I will call that ji1 of x1, j i n of x n. This is just a notation, but the idea is that this will be the same notation as Sugawa occurrence. So on the vector j of x equals j1 of x. Well, okay, sorry. So we are going to make a vector, but you see I leave some space. j1 of x j2 of x and so on jr of x it's a certain vector and it's go so it means that the currents are going to be vectors in fact they are vectors so in fact instead of really vector i should better take the diagonal matrix with this and it's really an element of a carton algebra it's going to be so typically it will be a, a, a carton Well, of, so in my case, it will be GLR, GLR. So which ju just means a diagonal matrix. Of size R. Excuse me? Is it a correlation function? For the moment, it's just a notation for the left-hand side. So the right-hand side is a notation for the left-hand side. It's it's going to be not exactly correlation function, but uh, conformal block. Uh, so, so I mean, basically, it contains only the holomorphic part, not the entire holomorphic part. But what I want to check is that it satisfies uh, W algebra constraints. So it satisfies Ward identities and OPs. And it will. So this is the theorem. And I think you have N and R, the integer. Sorry? The integer N wanted to be R. No, R is the, uh, no. the N is the number of points that you insert. 
but the indices are between 1 and R. For each of these, uh, so basically what I, I'm saying that G, for instance, J1 of X is the first component of a certain vector J of X. Okay, so, I, so okay. I mean, the fact that we have comp that we have indices here that's, that are in relationship to uh, the pre-images is uh, related to the fact that we have, I mean, basically, if you take all of them, you make a vector. Okay, that's yeah. And you make a vector for each point. So for each point, you have a vector. And you can also insert in the bracket the W case that I defined before. So if you take, for instance, Imagine that you take WK of X on delta Z uh, I, I1 of X1 of on your acting on your Z. This will just be the notation, the vertex operator that depends on your spectral curve times your W algebra generator times your j a1 of x1. So this is just the notation. Basically, everything I have on the left-hand side, I put it in the right-hand side. Okay? So this is a vector, or this is an element of uh, Carton algebra. This is, uh, so if you think of it, it was, uh, it was made of so basically, WK was made by combining the delta Z for all the, by taking symmetric combination of the de delta Z for a, given, uh, for a given point on the base. So basically, it's taking combinations, so basically polynomials of those things with different indices and symmetric combinations. So it's, in fact, it's making the Casimirs. So in fact, these are, uh, so with respect to the Carton algebra, uh, I mean, with respect to the Lie algebra that is here, the WKs are in fact Casimir's combinations of the uh, Sugawara currents. And the theorem is that those, uh, basically all those brackets satisfy everything that you want for a conformal field theory. Uh, so the satisfy Ward identities and OPE of a CFT. Not really an arbitrary CFT, the central charge uh, is basically the rank of the, of the Lie algebra. So the central charge C equals, in fact, in that case, it will be, I think, R or R minus one, I think. Well, mm, okay. Uh, no, maybe R. So basically this is the rank of the Lie algebra. Well, I, I don't want to enter the details, but this is, this is not an arbitrary central charge. You, you don't get arbitrary central charge, you just get very specific central charges. Uh, so for instance, with um, degree two cover, in SL2, you would get C equals one. Uh, but so, sa saying that it satisfies ward identities is the same thing as loop equations. And saying that it satisfies OPE just means that you have to study what happens when two points, for instance, x1 and x2 become very close, uh, how it behaves. And we have the definition of Z, so Z was defined in that way, you just compute. And basically, the only uh, thing that can diverge at very close points is omega zero two. And you compute how it behaves and it gives exactly the uh, OPEs of your CFT. So basically this defines a CFT. But this defines only a basis of conformal blocks. Uh, and it does not really, so if you really want to compute amplitudes in a CFT, you want to have something that is not only, uh, well, you, you want some quantity that is that takes, let's say, real values, and that has no monodromies. Yeah, but this 
Everything here has monodromies. It depends form on parameter h bar. Right? Yeah. It's not actual. Yes, yes. So it's a formal CFT. In fact, this is a um, heavy limit of CFT. It is a CFT in the heavy limit. So indeed, when I say it satisfies OPE and ward identities, that's uh, at the level of formal series in h bar. So it satisfies them at every order in h bar. So now let me go to more integrable systems. Uh, no, okay, let me state what I would like to be the Hirota equations. So Hirota equations. So uh, the definition is that a function tau from the space of spectral curve to C, uh, in fact, it will be, we'll have to, so is said to satisfy Hirota equation If, uh, well, if and only if, uh, okay. Uh, well, usually in the literature, the Hirata equations are written in that way. So you have tau is a function of time, t1, t2, and so on, t3, on an infinite number of times. These are going to be, in fact, my TPKs in some way. Uh, so you have an infinite number of times. There is a notation. So the t will be the vector t1, t2, and so on. Okay. There is a notation when you have a point. Uh, let me write it this way. Z equals, uh, here it will be, uh, so for me it will be a point on my curve. And I will use the coordinate d tau of z in a chart to get a real complex number. So my complex number will be zeta p of z, zeta p of z to the square, zeta p of z to the cube, and so on. So just so this is the vector whose components are just the powers of my coordinate. Okay, this is just a notation. And let me say how usually Hirota equations are written. You take a tau function at some time. You shift it by more or less an arbitrary vector u. And you shift it by your z. You multiply, so it's a bilinear relation. So you multiply by t minus u minus z. Okay, And you are going to take residue at, uh, so z goes to your pole. So remember those coordinates were local coordinates near p. Uh, so this is well defined in a certain neighborhood of p. And I take the residue there. And in fact, you should multiply by something which is, I think, exponential sum of 2 uk over k zeta p of z to the power minus k, I think. Uh, OK, maybe I did it wrong. So that's how usually, OK, let me call this t tilde because it's not exactly my t tilde. So somehow my, my tau will include this factor in the definition. OK. Uh, okay. If you take this, well, basically, this residue should be more or less zero, uh, up to some details, but very, uh, I mean, basically, you want to get zero. Uh, well, the meaning of that equation is that you should first, so you see, if you just take the residue at z equals to p, here you have an infinite series of things which have poles at z equals p. So it's exponential of some function which uh, diverges very badly, so it doesn't make sense. But if you take this as a 
power series expansion into u. So what you should do to compute this is first do a Taylor expansion in powers of u. And for each coefficient, now you have a residue of a rational fraction. So then it makes sense. And it gives relationship between the derivatives of tau. And there are nonlinear uh, differential equations. And they are the hierarchy of differential equations, typically kp uh, hierarchy. So that's how it's written usually. Well, first, the first remark is that instead of an arbitrary u, you could take uh, u of that type also. So instead of an arbitrary u, let me take a minus p and here a plus q. And then if you compute this factor with those times, what you get is just uh, zeta p of z. Sorry, let me call it p prime on q prime because it's not the same p on q. I mean, is p prime is not p, uh, OK? Zeta p of z minus zeta p of p prime times uh, zeta q of z. Sorry, zeta p of z minus zeta p of q prime. But just the computation of the exponential because uh, basically it was just the, the resummation of the log of exponential of log. So if you are careful, you get that. Now I will include these factors into the definition of my tau. So then I will redefine tau, tau to contain. So basically, this will be my whole tau. So what I'm going to write is that you get residue at z goes to p of tau of t minus p prime plus z times tau of t plus q prime minus z. OK? Basically equals 0. Again, you have to take the Taylor expansion at p prime and q prime going to p, then compute residues order by order. So it's, the, it's exactly the same thing. Well, another remark is that in when I define tau tilde, I will multiply by square root of d theta p of z, square root of d theta p of p prime. You see that this ratio, sorry, this is in the numerator. So this is included in the definition of my tau. And so this, is, so this tau will be a spinner form, a one-half form, the square root of a one form. When you multiply two of them, you get a one form. So it's meaningful to take a residue. The corresponding conserved quantity to this KP hierarchy are the WK or, or related? No, uh, no, it's more complicated. <laughs> OK. Uh, so, uh, so this is the Hirata equations as it is usually written in the literature. Now imagine that this quantity can be really a function of z on the whole spectral curve. And imagine that you would like to replace tau by this z. Remember that z was defined as a power series of things that have poles at the ramification points. So basically it means that order by order in h bar, all the terms of that quantity have poles as function of z, they have poles at ramification points. Well, they also have a pole at p, at, at z equals p prime, almost by definition, when I included that pole. But so the idea is that now, uh, if I want to compute the residue, uh, instead of integrating on a small circle around p, I'm going to move the integration contour and put it on the ramification points. So in fact, this residue, if if this quantity would be globally defined, a globally defined one form on the curve, then you could move the residue. It would be an abelian differential. You could move the residue to another place and basically to the other poles, and the poles are ramification points. So all the KP equations, if this quantity makes sense as a well-defined for one form on the spectral curve, all the KP equations can be written in that way, and that's how I'm going to define it. Uh, so 
if residue at a for at every ramification point so uh, so at every ramification point residue at a of tau of s plus uh, gamma p prime well in fact q prime to z tau of s plus gamma z to p prime equals zero It's one function. Sorry? It's not a function of the series. Well, it's a series. Okay. Of if you take z, then it's not a honest function because it depends on the homology path going from q prime to z. And it does not depend separately on the points z and q prime. It depends on the homology path. For every q prime yes, for every q prime p prime. So I would like now to construct something that is solution of that. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, so in fact, we define, so we define the becker kieser function that would be Usually it's written this way, psi, okay, let me write it this way, psi uh, z prime z would be the tau function of s plus gamma z prime to z over tau of s. Okay, in fact, I like better to write it as a divisor. Okay, no, okay, L let me write it this way. But so we would like to define the Baker Akizer function, and in fact, what we shall need is that this Baker Akizer function, we would like it to be really a function of the two points rather than a function. So the right hand side here is defined as a function, of the it depends on the homology path to go from z prime to z. Uh, so we have two points, z and z prime. But we have a path, and for instance, if we take another path, so a path going around a, a hole, you don't get the same result. You get a different psi. So is there an easy way to make it independent of a choice of, in, of, contour, of uh, contour that goes from z prime to z? And at the same time, we want to still have solutions of group equations. And there is a very easy way. Remember that in the solution of loop equations, I could add any element of H1. And in fact, element of H1 are precisely the ambiguity on how you go from uh, one point to the other. So we are going to take the summation over all. So I will define my tau function, and I will soon conclude. So now I will define tau of h bar minus 1 times the spectral curve will be. So the idea is we would like to sum over a network, uh, a lattice, sorry. We would like to sum over a lattice. So for the moment, let me write something which is slightly wrong. So what is tau or z? Sorry, now this will be tau. No, I'm not for the baker Akira function. Well, it's so if you have found a solution of, of your other equation, that's how you want to define the. Okay. So for the moment, it's sorry. This is not truly really a definition of psi. This is what you would like the definition to be. Uh, but I have not yet defined tau, so this is not yet defined. I mean, if you take z, then this is not a function of z prime and z. And also, Z has bad modular properties. If you change your Lagrangian, it changes in a way. I mean, it, it's multiplied by a phase, on, uh, which is not so well controlled. And uh, the idea is that we, we shall have a definition. Basically, we are going to sum over H1. Well, OK. Let me write 
So this is not the final thing. So this is going to be wrong, what I'm going to write. So we would like to sum over the lattice of simply Z L of uh, so of h bar minus 1 s plus n. Remember that this contains an exponential. Uh, so remember what it meant, this shift. It meant re this shift was ZL of h bar minus 1 of s times the Taylor series expansion, exponential sum over m equals 0 to infinity h bar, so, well, let's say, sorry, sum over g on m, uh, okay, uh, h bar to the 2g <coughs> minus 2 plus m over m factorial integral over, uh, sorry, no, sorry, this is plus n, So this was just the definition. So this is just saying that this is, so uh, I'm just saying here that shifting by n is just obtained by doing the Taylor expansion. Okay, some with m larger than one and somehow the terms m equals zero is that one. Now it's good to separate also the, the negative powers of h bar. So remember we had h bar to minus two F0 of S and L and exponential uh, F1 of S, which I did not define, but okay, believe me, and exponential sum of H bar. Uh, so, so basically, you can just write here all this table. No, you have, so in, sorry, in the unstable terms, you have h bar to the, so this is a minus 2, h bar to minus 1 sum over n of omega 0, 1 and exponential uh, 1 half of sum over n, sum over n of omega 0, 2. Okay? And then all the stable terms. So these are only the four unstable terms times all the stable terms. I mean, stable means uh, strictly negative, uh, strictly positive powers of h bar. Sorry? Is this somewhat different? This infinite sum? It's a formal series in powers of h bar. So the log is a formal series in powers of h bar. So it's well defined as a formal series in h bar. Uh, so now, yes, uh, sorry, you mean this sum? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm coming to it. You see in that sum, basically we have a term that is quadratic in n, a term that is linear in n in the exponential, times something which contains negative uh, positive powers of h bar. So you, you can take the h bar expansion and basically to each order in h bar, it will, it will be a polynomial in n. So what you get is that you get a sum of polynomials of n times exponential of n square on exponential linear in n, so basically you get a theta function or, or derivatives of theta functions. Well, the only thing is that you cannot really use the full h1 because in h, imagine that in h1 you have Kirby hat. And I r remind you that each time you integrate over Kirby hat, you get zero. So if you have Kirby hat in the sum, uh, basically if n belongs to Kirby hat, this is the same you can forget it somehow. So you don't want to sum over Kirby hat. So image, so assume, so let us assume here, assume uh, we have chosen omega zero two such that uh, basically Kirby hat is uh, an integer Lagrangian. So if you want, in the z square, so imagine that you are in genus one, you have your a cycle, your b cycle, any, uh, so any integer point 
So H1 of sigma Z is the set of integer points, so integer linear combinations of A and B. And imagine that Kirby hat, so uh, inter the intersection of Kirby hat with H1, well, it's a line. This line could have a rational slope or non-rational slope. So imagine that you have chosen one with rational slope. Okay. Basically, you want Kirby hat to go through integers. Something like that. And then we shall uh, choose a complement. So we shall choose L here. Uh, such that we can choose H1, uh, well, so sorry, such that H1 of sigma Z uh, inter Kirby hat uh, is uh, as dimension. The genus. So it's half dimensional. And we can choose a lattice, uh, well, lambda, such that, uh, such that H1 of sigma Z is the sum lambda. Plus, uh, plus this. So basically, imagine that Kirby hat is the A cycles. Imagine that A cycles is Kirby hat. And then we choose another one. We choose a network lambda that is complement of Kirby hat. Okay, it's not always possible to do that, but basically you are never far from the possibility to do that. So up to a very small modification of omega zero two, and we know how to take derivative respect to omega zero two uh, with BCOV like formula. So up to that we can always be on rationals. And when you do that, so basically you want to sum not over H1, but over lambda. So the idea is you want to sum over sub lattice uh, where you avoid the, the Kirby hat. Okay. And if you define if you if you define theta of u, so a one form, u belongs to uh, m1 of sigma. This will be sum over n belongs to lambda, so it will depend on your choice of lambda exponential integral over n of u, exponential one half so this is going to be what's called the theta function and in fact let me also uh, i pi uh, mu inter n so I introduce characteristics so basically here, mu, mu uh, belongs to H1 of sigma Z, and lambda also, uh, sorry, is a subspace, no, sorry, this belongs to, and mu lambda is a subspace of H1 sigma Z. So it's just the notion of choosing a theta function with a characteristic. So you see it's sum over an integer lattice with something exponential quadratic in N, exponential something linear in N, and basically this is the theta function, and so which means that your tau is so tau of h bar to the minus 1 to the s, and it depends on mu uh, lambda on L. In fact, it will not depend on L anymore, or, or in a very simple way. Uh, is Z L of H bar times theta of uh, mu lambda of H bar minus 1 omega 0 1 
times 1 plus h bar times something plus h bar squared times something and so on. And the something here contains derivatives of theta. Uh, okay, I see my time is over. So, uh, uh, but so there is a very simple formula. So what you see is that the tau function is Excuse me? It will be logarithmic derivatives of theta. Yes, uh, or in fact, it will be derivatives divided by theta. Uh, so I mean, le let me just write the formula quickly because it's very simple. I write, so if you take for the kth derivative, you take the same formula almost, theta k of u is sum over n to your lattice, exponential i pi mu intersection n, exponential integral n u, and exponential one half times n tensor n tensor n, k times. So this belongs to, so it belongs to uh, somehow uh, m1 of sigma to the case tensor product. So it's a tensor product of cycles, which means that you can integrate k form on it. And the, if you want to write the first term here, using this, so let me just write the formula here. So it's theta well, theta 1 is what I will call theta prime. Uh, theta prime that you apply. So theta prime is a cycle. You can uh, compute an integral of a one form on it. And the pairing, the integration pairing, let me write it this way, omega 1, 1 plus 1 over 6. And here you have theta third. Uh, so, yes, in indeed. So let's put one plus, and then it's not logarithmic derivatives. Theta third, so it's a product of three cycles, and you can integrate omega zero three on it, plus eight bar square, and so on. Okay? There is a nice way to encode all those terms in graphs. And they are typically the, gra the degeneracy graphs of Riemann surfaces. And in fact, it's very close again, this formula, to the BCOV formulation, uh, especially uh, Aganagic, uh, Aganagic Vafa way of writing things with graphs. And it's very close to that. And a very nice, pro a beautiful property is that, so indeed, if you put theta in factor 1 plus, and so you divide by theta and you divide by theta, a beautiful property is that this quantity is modular invariant. By yes. By sp2g? Yeah, by sp2g. It is modular invariant. It is truly modular invariant, uh, and at the same time holomorphic. But it depends on h bar in a subtle way. It's because you evaluate it at h bar to the omega. I mean, there is an h bar dependence. So it's somehow it's non-perturbative, but it's holomorphic and modular, but non-perturbative. The idea also is that the theta function is a periodic function, and somehow it's not large. It's of order one, and its derivatives are of order one. So you see that what we have is an h-bar expansion whose coefficients have a periodic dependence of on h-bar to minus one, but this periodic dependence is bounded. So this still makes sense as a power series. The coefficients do depend on h bar, but in a bounded way. And so this is uh, the end of my lectures. But what I just want to say is that this tau function somehow satisfies Hirota equations. If you compute the baker akizer function that comp uh, corresponds to it, then it did. It is the WKB expansion uh, of some uh, some differential equation. Uh, and, um, and it starts with exponential h bar to minus 1 because you divide by tau. 
So the h bar to minus two term is killed in the ratio. And, uh, and also, you see that it contains a power series in h bar, and also a power series in h bar whose coefficients contain periodic function of one over h bar, so typically exponential one over h bar times something uh, times something. So somehow it's I believe that all these terms are somehow the resurgent trans series part of the full answer. So it would be interesting to, to check uh, carefully the, the link to uh, resurgence on trans series and all that. But what I believe that is that this those terms are all the non-perturbative part of the series. And they are necessary. So if you don't put them, you are not solution of your equations. You are not modular invariant. And uh, you need them to be modular invariant. You need them to be solution of your equations. You need them to have a quantum curve. So you need them to have a kind of Schrodinger equation or something like that. OK, so thanks for, for your attention. <laughs>